thank you for that wonderful reminder that in times of testing and trials, we can call upon the name of God and he hears our prayers. Good morning. Uh, we want to greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And for all those who are watching us today, uh, I want to thank you for joining us uh, for worship in this way of worshiping, kind of a new way of worshiping, I guess. Uh, please let us know that you're watching by sending a comment uh, or a prayer request uh, or a like, uh, some way of letting us know you're out there. I want to thank all those who, again, are working on the front lines today of this uh, thing that's going on all around us. And those on the board of the PMC, those uh, who uh, have a lot on their shoulders. I think of everyone from uh, uh, the housekeepers who must go in and do the, uh, the really thorough cleansing to the nurses, uh, the people that do dialysis and the phlebotomists. Uh, and, uh, and even those that uh, are making decisions today, we're, we're praying for those. Uh, I'm thankful, thankful for the leadership of our government and our governor as well. Uh, governor Bashir is doing a tremendous job. And I want to thank our, uh, our officers, first responders, uh, people who put their lives on the line every day for the people uh, that they could be safe. Uh, it's just a, a blessing to know that uh, everyone's out there doing their jobs. And uh, we want to thank you, a special thank you. There's a saying you may have heard that uh, might be good for our times right now. It's called grace under pressure. Grace under pressure. Uh, that's the definition of courage. According to Ernest Hemingway, of course, uh, although to be accurate, he never actually said the word courage. Uh, a profile in the New York New Yorker says that he at, was asked exactly what do you mean by guts? And uh, he said, I mean grace under pressure. And so later, Senator John F. Kennedy uh, was used the line in one of his the first chapters of his books, uh, Profiles in Courage. And the book contains the stories of eight United States uh, senators and the way in which they responded to uh, gracefully to pressure, sometimes risking their own popularity and uh, their own careers to do so. All of them showed courage, grace under pressure. A couple examples of that. Uh, there's Jeremiah Denton, an American prisoner of war in Vietnam, who signaled the abuse that POWs were suffering by blinking in a propaganda video the message torture in Morse code. Uh, let's not forget Harriet Tubman, who escaped slavery and uh, via the Underground Railroad, and then uh, she risked re-enslavement and even death when she returned to the South on at least 19 trips uh, to guide as many people as as many as 300 slaves back to freedom. Uh, they faced tremendous pressure, and they responded with grace. That is, they showed fitness and uh, goodness in a difficult situation. Their excellence and personal power seem to have come straight from God. Today, we need God's strength and we need to keep the faith. And in the book of John, uh, chapter 9, there is a passage. And I'm not going to read it all today because there's 41 verses to this story. And I will spare you, but I would invite you, please read it at home in your spare time. And some of you will have some spare time, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, but in the last part of that, this is the man that was, the Bible says, was born blind. And Jesus comes along one day and heals him of his blindness. And uh, toward the end, uh, Jesus uh, comes back to him and said to him in verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? 
And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come to the world, that they which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees were, which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. And so, in this story, uh, the story of the man who was blind, Jesus heals him and, uh, of this. And, you know, it was a common belief in those days that if something bad happened to you, if you had some kind of a sickness, or there was something, some physical ailment with you, that you did something wrong, that you did something bad, that you had sinned uh, in, in all those things. And, you know, for example, in the book of Job, Job lost his health and his friends and many of his friends turned to him and said, Job, you, you did something wrong. There's something that you did that brought this upon you. And Job uh, kept saying, no, I, I didn't do anything. And I suppose it's not that much different today with people as we think about it. Uh, when something bad happens, uh, we have two or three reactions. Uh, first of all, we blame ourselves. I must have done something wrong. Or number two, we blame others. We, you know, my parents caused this. It's my parents' fault that I'm this way. We find, or the government, we find all kinds of reasons. Or number three, we blame God. You know, God caused this. It's God's fault. Uh, so there's all this blaming that goes on. Uh, as I said, in, in olden times, people believed that disease and Famine, earthquakes was a result of, of an angry God, and they would try to appease this God. But today we know something about germs. We know something about viruses, and we know about plate tectonics and, and a little bit more than, than we did back then. And so we understand that many of these things that happen come up on this world, and, and it's a part of the world we live in. Jesus told his disciples when they asked who sinned to cause this man's blindness, uh, when they asked that question, he said no one sinned. Not his parents, not him. There was no sin that caused this man's blindness because that was their thought that somebody had to have caused this poor man to be blind. Jesus said something that can be misconstrued. He said he was born blind so that God's work might be manifested in him. Now, there are at least two ways that we can take this uh, that Jesus said. One is God causes blindness so Jesus could come along a few thousand years from then and, or, or a few uh, years from then and uh, maybe heal him and, cause, and have a public demonstration of healing. Or two, God brought something good out of something bad. I kind of believe the latter. Uh, I don't believe God struck this man with blindness. Uh, I, I believe that he was born blind because of an illness. And, uh, and then God did something good and wonderful out of something bad. There's a wonderful verse in Romans 8.28 that is very familiar to many of you. And we know that all things work together for good to those who are called according to His purpose. So God takes the things that happen in our lives that may be terrible, may be bad, and can do some good things out of it. So already we can see that during this time of crisis, God is working in and behind the scenes. We're already seeing record number of people who are listening to sermons. I met with the Ministerial Association and at a distance the other day. Uh, we, we tried our best to practice social distance, but we needed to meet to talk about some things. And uh, one of the reports that's coming in is that all the pastors are saying that they're having a lot of response from this online worship, that people are, uh, are worshiping that would not probably have been in the church. And so that's a good thing that the gospel is going out and the message of good news of Jesus is, is being heard all over the world today. 
And uh, we're talking already about the, uh, the Easter uh, Holy Week services. Those are probably uh, going to be online as well as you might expect everything else is right now. Uh, so may this be a time of awakening for our world and our country. Uh, we see people today coming together to help other people. Uh, and in times like these, you know, we see the best and the worst in humanity. And in the story of the man who was blind, the religious leaders asked the man who was healed, how did this happen? How were you healed today? And instead of rejoicing in the miracle and thanking God for a miracle that was wrought, they were trying to get someone in trouble. They were trying to find someone to blame. You know, and the story kind of takes a funny turn. When the man says, and then when they press on him and kept asking the questions, he finally says, why do you ask? Do you want to be his disciples as well? And of course that infuriated them even more because they did not want to be his disciples. They were just trying to cause problems. And you know, there will always be those in the church today that are close enough to God to cause trouble, but not close enough to really see the wonderful things that God is doing around them. And so we need to be looking at those things as if we, you know, we can't see everything, but we can see the hand of God moving. And when God is doing something in our midst, we need to understand that uh, God can work in ways that we can't even imagine. And so this man basically says, all I know is this. I was blind, but now I see. Can't help but think of that verse from Amazing Grace. When we think Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. But now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. You see, the real problem that God is exposing here is spiritual blindness, of course. The truth is, most of the character in this story were uh, suffering from spiritual blindness. They just could not see, and one of them had physical blindness, and he was healed from that. And, and you know, the story that Johnny read earlier from the book of Samuel, the story of David and God trying to find uh, a king, uh, says that God, uh, that people look on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. God does not see as we see. And God sees things that we don't see. And we need to be reminded that that we may, uh, what we see may be limited, that God sees it all. And so we all have a little bit of blindness, don't we, in that sense, that we can't see everything. Paul said we see through a glass darkly. Things are very dark. And in this story of John, Jesus does a very strange thing. He tells, first of all, he spits in the mud and he takes it and puts it on this fellow's eyes and tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And that's a very strange thing to do. And so the guy goes and washes and he is healed. And we have to understand that there was nothing probably special about that mud. I imagine if people could find the mud that Jesus spit in today, it would be probably bottled up and sold some way. Uh, but it wasn't the mud. It was that it was touched by Jesus. And God's ways are not our ways. And there's a lot of things we don't understand. There's a lot of things about God that, doesn't, that we don't understand. And a lot of things about our world that we don't understand. But here's what I know. God can take normal, everyday things like mud and do extraordinary things with them. Uh, he can just do a lot of things that we cannot even imagine. And often he doesn't work in the ways that we expect him to. He does great things. And I love, you know, being able to say, uh, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. But if we do what God asks of us, then we can see great things as well. 
our psalm reading in our lectionary text uh, today was Psalm 23. Very loved and familiar passage. And David says, Yea, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You see, he's talking about darkness there. He says, I'll fear no evil. So there's times in this world where there is darkness and where we are blind to what is in the darkness. You know, if, you, if you've ever been up at night when the lights are out or been outside in the woods or whatever when there is no light, it's hard to see in the darkness. There's things out there that you can't see. But David said, even in this darkness, I'm not going to fear because I know God is with me. If you understand that the presence of God is with you in these times of testing, in these times of trouble, then you will be able to put your trust in God. And we're reminded of Peter who walked on the water, who during this terrible storm, when he kept his focus on Jesus, everything was fine. But the moment he took his eyes off of Jesus, guess what happened? He saw the wind and he saw the trouble and began to sink. Today, I want to encourage you not to spend all of your time watching the news. Because I will tell you that most of it is not fun to hear. And it's enough to drive you insane. So I would encourage you to turn off the news and just catch up on the highlights uh, throughout the day. And spend that time doing other things. Being with your family. Reading. Uh, you know, watch something that's not about what's going on in our world today. Because I believe that uh, our minds, uh, how we uh, concentrate on things and how we uh, focus on things will affect our attitudes and our fears and all those things. Our Ephesian text today that we didn't read, but it was from the uh, book of Ephesians. Paul says these words. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. For once you were dark in darkness, but now in the Lord you are in light. Live as children of the light. Sleeper, awake. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And I want to remind you, God is with you, even if you can't see God in the darkness. Maybe we should ask God to open our eyes that we can see. We're living in trying times. There is fear and worry all around us. And today, uh, like I said, pretty much all we hear is bad news. Uh, and, you know, not knowing how long the quarantine will last, not knowing how bad it's going to be. Uh, we're in a state of darkness, partial blindness. And... Uh, if you'll uh, permit me to use this analogy, I believe that God wants to allow us to open our eyes to see things that we never saw before. You know, there are good things happening. There are drugs that are currently showing some promising results. We want to continue to pray uh, for those that are working on the, the scientists and all those that are working on this. And this gives us some encouragement in the darkest of times. And I want to encourage you to turn to God to do family devotions together, to find ways to get your mind off of these things. And I believe that God will bless you. We don't know how long these things are going to last. We're, you know, we're, uh, we're here for you. We'll try to reach out to you by telephone or uh, however, Facebook, however we can do that. But we're available if you have a prayer request, if there's something that we can do for you, if you have a need please let us know. And I want to mention too, uh, again, uh, since we're not meeting as we normally do, we want to offer you the opportunity uh, you, can, you can give as we, we call it worship and giving. It's a part of worship. And uh, you can do that. Uh, we are talking about possibly or thinking about uh, for Easter offering some type of a come and go communion, sort of like we do on uh, Christmas Eve to where uh, one family or one person could come in and do the communion and you can leave your offerings and, and pray whatever you need to do. Uh, so we're still looking at that uh, if we're not meeting as uh, people. But I want us to continue to pray. I don't want us to lose the connection we have with one another. 
maybe we can figure a way to do a group telephone meeting or something uh, for a Wednesday night service sometime. So all this is new and we're treading on on ground that we've never been on. So we want to continue to pray for everyone today and just continue to try to be a blessing to someone if you can. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes right where you are at this moment. And I want to invite you to pray with me this simple Jesus prayer, sinner's prayer, whatever you want to call it. And whether or not you confess to be a Christian or not, we all can benefit from praying the sinner's prayer because we're all sinners. But especially if you don't know God right now, in these anxious and uncertain times, I want to invite you to call upon the name of the Lord because He promised He would never turn away anyone who called upon Him. Pray with me as we pray. Lord Jesus, have, merciful, have mercy on me, a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. And God, lead me in the way that I should go. Right now, I trust in you. Amen. We're going to do our benediction and benediction song. And I want to uh, thank uh, Johnny Ford for playing piano, my wife Sandy for the playing the organ, and Andy Swanson for uh, doing the uh, video uh, today. And we'll be getting that out to everyone. And so thankful for you guys. And continue to pray for us. Hear the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.